Hello and welcome to another episode of Cinematic Sunday. It's great to see you guys. I hope that you're all doing really well. I'm super pumped. Got a really cool episode for you this week. I teamed up with a good friend of mine, Chris Watkins. Uh, he's a fellow YouTuber and videographer and has a YouTube channel called Chris Watkins Media, which I will uh, provide a link in the description below so please make sure you go and check him out and subscribe to his channel. Chris also has a weekly series, uh, his is called Film It Friday and the intention between the two of us really is very similar. It's to provide a community uh, and education for fellow YouTubers, fellow videographers that want to uh, better their craft and their skills in order to become better cinematographers. So let's get cracking with today's episode. So the reason that I've asked Chris to join me in this video is because I own the A6300 and I want to get his thoughts on whether the A6500 is worth that extra £450. So one of the big differences that really um, determined which camera I was going to get was going to be that in-body image stabilisation. So Chris, tell me a little bit about the in-body stabilisation, um, how much do you use it and do you think it's worth it for the extra money? Uh, so yeah, I'll start off by saying that, uh, it, so is the in-body in image st stabilisation any good? Yes it is, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, and, the, and, the, and the, the second benefit that you get from having IBIS in the camera uh, is that then whatever lens you stick on there uh, is effectively stabilised uh, as well. Um, even more so if you, uh, you know, if you have a native lens that's got optical stabilization as well then you get you know the, the the benefit of the of the two of two of those operating together um i've had the sony a6500 for a little over a year now and when i first got it uh i was predominantly shooting handheld i didn't have a gimbal or any other uh form of stabilizer so uh i was using the old trick of you know tightening the straps around the back of my neck trying to keep it taut uh, and, and using that technique in conjunction with the IBIS, um, I think you'll agree, Chris, there's quite, you know, quite a few videos on my channel now where uh, you know, it looks very cinematic and actually looks like, especially in 1080, um, that you know, it was being shot on a gimbal or some form of stabiliser. So in that regard, yes, it's, it's really good. Uh, is it uh, ultimately worth uh, the additional £450 investment? Uh, that's a subjective thing, isn't it? I think... If you're not planning to shoot on a gimbal or a stabilizer um, and you want nice clean you know footage that isn't bouncing around all over the place and again you know obviously primarily for video we're talking about here not photography uh, if that's the case then I would say you know yeah it, it may well be worth it however you know we tend to shoot on uh, gimbals these days you know as a wedding videographer and like yourself Chris you know uh, I, I tend to shoot mostly on a gimbal, if not on a monopod, or even the, the gimbal on top of the monopod. So I'm getting inherently stable footage uh, as it is. So uh, Chris and I uh, went out yesterday uh, and performed a number of uh, real world tests. We met up uh, somewhere local to us near uh, Devizes at Roundway Hill and took the cameras up there with the gimbals. And uh, as we'll show you later, we shot a whole bunch of tests. Uh, to ultimately try and answer the question of, you know, do the differences between the 6300 and the 6500 stack up commercially uh, or, or is the A6500 that much more relevant given the IBIS at a, at a higher price tag of 450 quid? Yeah, but it's not just it's not just the IBIS that is the difference between the two cameras. Um, so that, that 450 quid, that's, that's kind of the, that was the the turning point as to whether I was going to get this, the def deciding factor as to whether I was going to be getting the A6300 or the 6500. Um, and for me, most of the time my camera does live on a gimbal. So it, it made sense for me to just get the A6300. Um, I do have a question for you though. Do you use the steady shot feature when you've got it on a gimbal? 
Yeah, it's always on. Yeah, it's always on. Right. Okay. Because I hear sometimes that it does it does strange things to the image. But if you always have it on, then yeah. I've seen your work. I'm I'm confident that uh, it's it's doing the job correctly. Yeah, absolutely. I've not I've never noticed any uh, any kind of micro jitters or anything going on untoward that would make me kind of suspect that that wasn't helping things. So yeah. Right. Okay, so let's talk about another issue. Uh, overheating. Do you find that the A6500 overheats? No. Uh, well, so the A6500, so, so let's, let's, let's step back a bit. The A6300 um, was renowned for, and, and again, you know, as part of my research into uh, the Sony Alpha uh, cameras, and, and I, I did look at the the, not only the, the A6300, I looked at the A6000 and obviously the A6500. Um, and right. the one of the things, or probably the thing that put me off the most uh, with the A6300 was the, uh, the well-known issue of overheating. Um, both cameras have got a record limit of 29 uh, minutes. Um, so you can't get around that. But in certain situations, in, uh, you know, in high ambient temperatures, the A6300 can just switch off if it gets too hot. Um, yeah, I know that only too well. <laughs> and obviously, you don't want that when you're filming, you know, a wedding ceremony, or just have that on your, you know, that an anxiety on your mind uh, when you're trying to work, you know, commercially with these cameras. So, for, yeah, yeah, that for me, that was one of the main deciders as well. Was the uh, was the uh, the temperature. Uh, and the cutout on there. So on the A6500, there's a you can go into the settings and you can change. I think it's auto power off temp is one of the yeah. settings, and you can have that on normal or on the A6500. You can turn it to high, and effectively what that does is even if the camera overheats, it doesn't switch off and stop recording. Um, I actually yeah. watched uh, I actually watched a uh, a video today from Jason Lehner, one of my favorite photographers, and he's a big Sony advocate as well. Uh, and he actually performed a, uh, a test to try and see where the, the you know, the cutoff point would be in some fairly high ambient temperatures. He was outside in sort of 75, 78 degrees uh, and ran the Sony A6500 A6 for about an hour and 10 minutes and it never cut out despite, you know, throwing up the warning on the display. So it does seem that wow. with that, that they did sort it out. So yeah, it's less of a headache. Yeah, see, that is something I've encountered quite a lot on the A6300. Um, even in quite mild temperatures, if you're going to be shooting 4K, um, we, we've shot a couple of weddings where we've had that um, warning light come up on the camera when we've been in November, but we've been inside um, a big um, theatre or something like that and we've been filming for 29, 30 minutes and then we've started it over again and it's just the actual temperature that the 4K produces that is making our cameras shut down. So even if it's not a hot day, we were still having that issue. Um, but if you're managing that temperature, if you're changing the battery regularly, so that when your camera overheats, all of that overheating is in that battery. So you swap that battery out and your problem should be resolved. And since we've learned that, we've never really had a problem with it. And we even shot a wedding in Malta last year. Average temperature throughout the time that we were filming was 35 degrees um, and it didn't overheat once. So I think if you, if you manage it, then it's not such a big problem, but it could cause you really big issues. Um, and on the same uh, point as that, when we've had it cut out, it does actually corrupt that file that it was recording. So if you were really? recording a 20-minute long, 20 minute long um, piece of footage and it cut out on you, then you would lose that footage. Ah, uh, right. Um, I, I wasn't aware of which, that, see. So that, yeah, yeah. That, that further... I don't know when it happens you. every time, but it's happened to us and that footage has been corrupt. And that's caused us big issues. The other, um, the other way around this apparently is to uh, to use a dummy battery, so to power the camera. So I've, uh, as I showed you yesterday, I've got the DJI Ronin S, and I've recently bought uh, the, the power adapter for the for the Ronin to power the Sony via a dummy battery. Uh, and I haven't fully tested it yet, and I will I'll conclude this in in a in a further video on my channel. But uh, by all accounts, it, you don't have the overheating issue. Uh, if you use a dummy battery because they don't get as hot as a normal battery would do because it's being powered uh, by DC DC power. So on the whole, these cameras are really similar. Uh, they have got the same sensor. 
they produce exactly the same image. Uh, the body is very, very similar. There are a couple of really small changes. Um, so what, what else made you decide to buy the A6500 over the A6300, Chris? Yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. So there is no difference at all in the image quality. Um, they've got exactly the same sensor, the same size sensor, and the same uh, image processor as well. So, so yeah, we're talking, you know, minor uh, minor differences between the two. Other, I guess the IBIS is probably the biggest one, but the, the other factors uh, were the the menu system. Um, so the menu system on the A6500 uh, is not perfect. Let's let's start with that. But it's a lot more organised and easy to navigate than the A6300. So all of the various sections within the menu are kind of colour coded, uh, which just makes it a little bit easier to kind of memorise your most uh, favorite you know settings or, or your most go-to uh, settings um, that said uh, you know you can customize uh, quite a lot on the 6500 as well so that the a6500 has three custom buttons I think the 63's got two custom buttons I'm gonna check this because you told me this yesterday and I want to make sure I've got custom one <laughs> Custom two, and I, I can't see a custom three, so I'm assuming you are correct, but I didn't actually know that. Yeah, exactly. So you've on the 6500, you've got C1 and C2 on the top, uh, and then C3 is also the delete button uh, on the, on the ah, back. So, oh. so C2 is next to the shutter button, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so on the A6, uh, A6300, I've only got the one up there. I'm trying to show my camera. Yeah, they're kind of behind the, the shutter button a bit because the... The grip on the right hand side as well of the 6500 is slightly larger it's a bit more ergonomic and feels a bit better in the hand uh, and you've got the shutter button just a bit further forward on that uh, on that additional um uh you know on the additional uh, size of the grip there so right, okay. so it's um so it's easy to customize um and it just gives you that flexibility to be able to hone in you know another one of your most go-to settings um, both cameras do have like the function button as well so you can go into the menus and you can uh, you can with the function button you can bring up uh, a menu as like a, a sub menu on the screen that takes you right into your favorites um, so you can go in there on one touch and then you can access uh, you know your uh, your, auto, your your autofocus you can adjust um, the picture profiles and stuff like that so there it, it's not the end of the world the customization thing again it's just another nice to have I would say uh, on the 6500 over the a6300 but it's a minimal thing to be honest yeah so I, I completely agree it's it is a nice to have I don't tend to use those custom buttons very much I do use the function button um, but yeah, they're, they're just extra buttons on the camera that I don't really use. So again, for me personally, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal. Um, on, the, on the subject of the screen we were just talking about, your screen's actually touchscreen, isn't it? Um, and on the A6300, it's not touchscreen. Do you think that's useful and do you ever use it? And what, what scenario would you use that in? Um, it, yeah, it's useful. Um... You could say it's a bit gimmicky. Uh, it, 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 again, it all depends on it's subjective. It depends on what you're using the camera for. So, to give a good example, uh, in our sector, in that you know, as professional wedding videographers, um, one case where it comes in really useful is for detail shots. So, if you have, for example, um, you have a subject close, and then you have a a, a subject behind that a bit further away. Uh, you can line up the shot focused on the on the closest part of the foreground and then you can click on the screen uh, and it will pull focus uh, to uh, to the other subject. So that can be really useful. It just uh, it saves you doing it manually and it does it in a real kind of fluid and, and crisp way that does look really nice. So again, it's it's not a it's not a game changer, but it's another nice feature to have. Great. So, do you find that when you're using that feature, it ever hunts around, or is it is it really spot on every single time? Yeah, no, it's usually pretty spot on. Obviously, if uh, if the lighting conditions are okay, uh, and uh, you know you're not wide open, you're, it, the autofocus is autofocus, right? You're always going to have uh, you're always going to have to battle with the elements depending on um, on the conditions. But yeah, generally it's uh, it's pretty good, especially with a you know with a native Sony lens. There's nothing better than you know the the marriage of the um, the autofocus with the 425 phase detect points 
and, uh, and a native Sony lens. Um, it's just it's super. It's very very. And again, that was what that was one of the reasons that drew me to the a the uh, a seven series. Uh, sorry, the a six thousand series uh, range of the Sony cameras. It's just that for the price point, there really isn't a better or wasn't at the time. I should say uh, a better autofocus. Um, uh, technology out there on the market with it, like I say, in that price band. Yeah, it's worth saying that both cameras do have the same autofocus system as well. I don't think we mentioned that. So they are exactly the same autofocus system and they should focus at the same pace. Right, so knowing what you know now um, and you know that the A6500 is £450 more than the A6300, would you still buy the A6500 over the 6300? Good question. And, and why? Yeah, very good question. Um, so, uh, I guess it's a subjective thing because I've, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have invested further in my gear. Um, yeah. And as as we kind of mentioned earlier, you know, I shoot predominantly on a gimbal now. So, the the key driving factor, or one of the key driving factors, being the IBIS on the sixty five hundred, kind of becomes a little less relevant now given that i can you know i can get the stabilization via a gimbal or a monopod or, or whatever um so uh is it worth the extra money it's really hard i would probably err on the side of saying no it's probably not worth it providing that you're going to use some form of of stabilizer with the 6300 um yeah if if you're absolutely just going to go handheld and you want to shoot a bunch of video um then if you can afford it the 6500 is a really good choice I'm, you know i can't i can't deny that um my next investment will be uh, a sony a6300 uh, as a b camera um for my for my business where i go out shooting wedding films um because like we discussed earlier it's a great camera it's it has you know the same image quality of the a6500 i can match it up with the same picture profile um, and that for me is huge. And, you know, if I stick that on a tripod and that's my, you know, that's my static shot camera. Uh, or even if I put the 6500 on a, on a tripod and then put the 6300 on a gimbal, either way I'm going to win. So it, it makes sense for me. And, uh, yeah, ultimately, I think uh, for the price point, the 6300, you've, I would say yeah. you've got to give that the advantage considering all the other features that it has got that are really, really solid and good. Yeah, so from, from my point of view, when I was looking at the differences between the A6300 and A6500, I already had a DJI Ronin M, I think, at the time. Um, I, I came from the A7S, I had the Canon 5D, I had the Canon 6D, so I was kind of, I already had all the gear that went along with it. So for me, it didn't really make sense. So if you're in the position where you're going to be starting out in this business, then maybe the A6500 is the way to go. And if you've already got a gimbal or you've already got some decent stabilization gear, then maybe the A6300 is the way to go. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, spot on, I would say. Yeah. Okay, so me and Chris did actually do some comparison shots with our cameras, like Chris said earlier. We did some ninja walking with our gimbals. Um, we did some normal walking with our gimbals. Uh, we did some walking handheld without a gimbal. That's probably going to be the, the one you really want to watch out for, see how Chris's camera stacked up against my camera. Um, and then we did some running tests. And you will definitely, I, well, I haven't looked at the footage yet, but I'm assuming you're really going to be able to notice the difference in the footage. And then we also just shot some B-roll in 120 frames a second, and we did that handheld. And you can see my, um, my B-roll little section, which I'm going to put into my film, and Chris is going to put his into his film, so you can make up your own mind, but you will have to watch both videos to find out which one is best.
So there you have it guys. I hope that has been of some value to you guys if you're looking uh, you know, to make the decision over the, uh, the A6300 or the A6500. I hope those have been some tasty little nuggets for you to digest. Uh, it was really good fun actually going out and uh, performing these tests and just hanging out with Chris in general. Uh, we've known each other for a little over a year now and obviously I've got a lot in common and I really look forward to to working with Chris and collaborating further in the future with regards to our channels. So that's pretty much it from me guys. I will play a little uh, montage of some of Chris's footage now uh, to lead out the video. But uh, other than that, thank you very much for checking in. Please subscribe. If you like the video, please interact, like and comment and share on your social media. It would be a huge help to me in building my channel. So that's it. Thanks again, guys, and I'll catch you next week on Cinematic Sunday. Chris out. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Film It Friday. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking to you about cloud editing. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Film It Friday. If you did, please like the video um, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for watching and see you again next time.